The camera is rolling. see the, the trace 
And when music is playing, you can see which parts of the brain are being activated. And then um, an MRI stands for magnetic resonance imaging, and that is um, it's a magnetic field um, used to create computerized image of internal structures. And actually, I want to show you guys an example of how it works. Um, this is an example of how one feels emotionally about a piece of music is, con is um, confirmed by the brain. And you can see that <coughs> in this clip. <coughs> The well-known writer and neurologist Oliver Sacks is exploring the idea of how the brain reacts to music. He is trying to figure out why some brains can't decode music at all, while others are sensitive to the slightest musical nuance. In general, I'm a Bach lover and have always been, you know, even when I was a, uh, a kid when I was five, I'm told that I was asked what my favorite things in the world were, and I said smoked salmon and Bach. <laughs> and 70 years later, it's still pretty much the same. In his quest, Dr. Sachs is offering himself up as a test subject. A team of neuroscientists at Columbia University have designed a test that will reveal if the brain of Dr. Sachs loves Bach as much as he does. Hal Hinkle gives Dr. Sachs a device to rate his emotions. While at the same time, a scan will record the activity of his brain. <laughs> He'll hear two pieces of music, one by Bach and one by Beethoven. First the Bach. Then the Beethoven. Composers are different, but the music shares certain qualities. Oliver, that completes the first emotional scan. I would like to hear how that was for you. The results of the scan amazingly seem to confirm his feelings. What you can see just in an immediate uh, overview here is that this is your Bach brain and this is your Beethoven brain. Sorry, Ludwig. Yeah, sorry, Ludwig. There's not much there. Bach clearly excited much of his brain, including the many regions essential to appreciating the complexity of music. <laughs> but unlike Beethoven, Bach activated the amygdala, which is vital to processing emotions. Here we see... Um, so as you can see there, um, he did say that he was a Bach lover, and when he was put in a PET scan, it showed just what he said it would, and his brain loves it just as much as he does. Actually, the other part of the clip is um, him not knowing which is Bach and which is Beethoven, and the brain still chose Bach over Beethoven, which is pretty cool. Um, so then I'm actually going to move on to depression, and I'm going to give you a little bit of background of what um, depression is. Um, it's, a, it's a malfunction in your brain, and um, it's an imbalance of neurotransmitter levels like serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And as you can see, I'm trying to move my mouse here, all three, what all three of these have in common is mood and cognitive function. So if you have an imbalance in these, um, your mood is most likely going to go downhill, whereas if you had a balance of them, it's most likely uh, you're more positively you know, affective. And um, also in, in depression patients, the amygdala is more neg negatively active in um, those diagnosed with depression. So when you add music to maybe treat depression or look at it just from a psychological aspect, um, they actually have a negative bias toward music. So they reported a, um, a higher rating of sadness, fear, and anger, and they reported lower ratings of um, happiness and tender emotions. So um, actually looking when you add music, um, the brain works 
together to alleviate pain in the Christian teaching. And I want to take you through really quick um, what pain, uh, how pain kind of <coughs> works, so that way I can show you what music does in order to prevent pain from occurring. A nerve receptor, which is a special pain sensing nerve. That stimulus is propagated along the course of a peripheral nerve toward the spinal cord, but it's not pain yet. Eventually, that signal will reach the spinal cord, where it will be passed from the first order or primary neuron to the second order neuron. Again, it's still not pain. Here we see an example of that signal being transmitted from one nerve to another. Now, this is an important area because this is one of the areas where some of our medications have an effect on pain and how pain is being pursued and transmitted. Eventually, the pain signal will ascend within the spinal cord and reach parts of the brain, first the thalamus and then out to the cortex. Now, this is where things get very interesting because it's not until that signal reaches the cortex and other areas of the brain where it's interpreted in some emotional context only then is it experienced as pain. So based on that pain pathway, what researchers have found is that music can help reduce the pain. And what it does is, um, as pain starts in the somatosensory cortex and the hypothalamus, um, the music, when you listen to it, it releases and um, it, it releases endorphins which are connected to um, kind of the love and that kind of stuff. And um, it releases the neurotransmitter and it can lead to the pain reduction because what it's doing is the pain is going in the same pathway as the endorphins. And that, um, that crossroad can delay pain and even reduce it because you have endorphins and you have pain and the endorphins reduce the pain. Um, so, in conclusion kind of thing is um, hopefully you got out of this is uh, what parts of the brain are activated during music listening, um, what emotions are induced by listening to music, um, I've learned a little bit about what an EEG, a PET scan, an MRI scan do, like how it measures um, emotions and brain activities listening to music. Music is a <coughs> on depressed patients and how in those patients it can alleviate pain. Very, very good. Um, let's have Miss Bridget.